Welcome, fellow fashionistas, style makers, aspiring designers, and those of you who love to tap into your inner creativity. Thank you for joining Worcester Historical Museum as we explore fashion design process with Jay Calderon. I'm Ann Sadik, Director of Development and Pretty Powerful Project Manager. This is the eighth program supporting the museum's landmark exhibition, Pretty Powerful, 100 Years of Voting and Style, which runs through March of 2022, Women's History Month. After a brief overview of the Pretty Powerful exhibit by our hosts and Pretty Powerful co-chairs, Marlene Persky and Moira moynihan Manoog, Jay Calderon will share some fundamental essentials to planning and executing fashion projects. Then Pretty Powerful advisor and fashion designer, James Hogan, along with Marlene and Moira, We'll have a chat with Jay, incorporating questions from our guests. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the program. Pretty, pretty powerful in the words of Larry David. 100 years of voting and style is Worcester Historical Museum's landmark exhibit celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote through fashion and changing roles of women. The clothing in Pretty Powerful is from the museum's strong collection, as well as loans from the community. In 1904, 16 years before the 19th Amendment vote, Harriet Merrifield Forbes began the collection of costumes and textiles for the Worcester Historical Museum. It was then known as the Worcester Society of Antiquity. The costume contains over 5,000, the collection contains over 5,000 costumes and accessories. Among them, there are over 800 women's garments from the 1750s to the present. They include handbags and shoes, dresses, underclothing, sleepwear, hats, quilts, coverlets, and even uniforms. Pretty Powerful is a tribute to the changing roles of women as seen through the lens of fashion. It is a look at women's history and power from 1920 to 2020, telling the story through 36 garments and accessories. This exhibit is just a very small sampling of the riches of the museum's collection. Our guest presenter, Jay Calderon, is an author, artist, educator, designer, and the founder executive director of Boston Fashion Week. His fashion design work has graced the pages of Vogue and Elle magazines and has been, and has been acquired by the Peabody Essex Museum and featured in the New York Times. He teaches at the School of Fashion Design in Boston, the Mass College of Art and Design, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. His artistic endeavors explore the intersection between communication, technology, culture, and communication. The Boston Globe refers to Jay as a budding designer's best friend. The LA Times called his book, The Fashion Design Reference and Specification Book, which was recently just translated into French, a new fashion Bible for designers, aspirers, and the just plain curious. This tomb contains all the secrets. Jay, we are so excited to welcome you here tonight. Um, for all of our viewers, please share with us in the chat box throughout this presentation, your favorite historical and or contemporary designers. Jay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a privilege to be a part of the programming for a pretty powerful 100 years of voting in style. Um, I've divided my presentation into three small parts. Um, I hope that each part will serve as an introduction to, uh, to a way to engage with fashion content. So first I'll share why I believe exhibits like Pretty Powerful are so important. This will be followed by a brief tour through this year's Boston Fashion Week content. And then I'll wrap up with some insights into what the design process is like for the fashion designer. 
So um, let me just share my screen and we'll get started. There we go. Okay. So, all right. So uh, museums have always been an integral part of my creative process, whether I'm re researching a fashion concept, uh, writing a book, or developing a new curriculum. Um, and I believe that museums are a valuable resource because curators are such great storytellers. They put garments, in this case, um, into context for us. As a teacher, these carefully curated stories help me build a world around the content that I'm teaching so that my students see more than just garments. Um, Pretty Powerful tells us uh, three important stories. So the first story was built around making it work. What do the clothes we wear reveal about the work that we do? Here we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the victory suit. And this garment helps us identify the wearer as someone who is part of the post-World War II workforce and all that that means. Um, that message has continued to evolve over time. Um, I have here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a few images of the Donna Karen ad campaign circa 1992 called In Women We Trust. So putting a woman in the role of president of the United States. So every generation has used a fashion to define that era's professional woman. When it comes to present day, the definition has expanded considerably to include a broad spectrum of professions. The, um, the uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, one second. Okay. Um, and then we have our third story, which is about the power of clothes. How can the way we dress tell the world who we are? And here we have a former first lady in the little picture there, um, Michelle Obama, wearing a diplomatic dress on a visit to India. The dress was designed by Indian American designer Bibhu Mohapatra, and um, it allowed the first lady to express who she is as a diplomatic figure. Uh, I love that in the ex exhibition catalog, it calls it sartorial diplomacy. I just love that. Um, I'm gonna borrow that just <laughs> so for some of my classes. Um, and, and fashion has been a tool of self-expression for many first ladies. And here we have a former first lady, Jackie Kennedy, on a visit to India in 1962. And what I love, uh, again, besides the, colors, uh, the color palette for her wardrobe, this jacket, which she arrived in, uh, was, the collar on it was a nod to the Nehru jacket and very timely and, and again, appropriate for where she was gonna be. <clears throat> then we have um, a seat at the table. And um, how do fashion choices create and amplify political messages? Here we have a very meaningful white pantsuit worn by Senator Harriet Chandler. And uh, first, there is the power of the pantsuit. And I'm going to share a little personal anecdote. I remember my grandmother sometime in the late 70s coming home in her first pantsuit. I also remember my grandfather looking like his head was going to explode, uh, forbidding his wife from ever wearing pants in public. My grandmother wore pants almost exclusively ever since. And I think that was pretty powerful. It's, it, that's a memory that's so vivid in my mind when it comes to fashion. Now, uh, then, you know, then there's the color. Wearing white as a group was a way of using fashion to make a bold political statement, both then and now. So here we see the senators in suffrage white, utilizing it in much the same way at the State of the Union in 2019. <clears throat> Looking at the exhibit this way definitely helps me uh, helps to inform the way I'll share the history of fashion with my students. Um, I hope that all of you have the opportunity to find the stories that resonate with you uh, throughout the uh, pretty powerful exhibition. So now I'd like to uh, switch over to another way to engage with fashion um, and take you on a brief tour of this year's Boston Fashion Week. Having just celebrated 20, our, our 27th year, Boston Fashion Week is definitely a part of our regional fashion history. And uh, here's actually a picture of the archives. And yes, that's a very much younger me down in the middle. And um, 
But this year, uh, we, I, I feel like we made history exploring one of fashion's new frontiers, augmented reality, AR. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, augmented reality is a technology that superimposes a computer-generated image on the user's view of the real world, providing a composite view. So we wanted to, um, to have each designer feel like they had their own gallery in neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, many of these exhibits were out in public spaces. We curated a group uh, that included uh, a mix of established designers as well as newcomers. And we also wanted to feature more than fashion design. So we have galleries dedicated to accessory designers, photographers, illustrators, textile designers, fashion schools, historical fashion archives, stylists, and beauty professionals. The hover lay app that we uh, partnered with allows you to capture images and video letting the user assume the role of creative director in terms of how they document their experience. Um, so now let's see some of the content captured by the community at locations throughout the city. So here we have uh, the Omni Hotels and Resorts, their new uh, location at the seaport. And they created this wonderful little video to give you kind of a glimpse of what it's like to hold your phone up to the QR code and see what happens. <laughs> So that those images you saw of those great shoes by Tom Solo weren't actually in the room. Again, you could only experience them through your phone. And it was like having Boston Fashion Week in your pocket and you unlocked content throughout the city. Here we have uh, the, the iconic uh, Yolanda Salucci, and uh, she wrote uh, her second book in tribute to her daughter who passed away, uh, Lindy Lou and her modeling debut. And we were able to have this bigger than life-size Lindy Lou in front of the Boston Public Library. And uh, here we have Daniel Hernandez's um, menswear collection, which was actually shot on trains in the Harvard uh, train station. So we superimpose these over the ads um, at, at the plat on the platform. And then this is actually one of my designs, the quarter century kimono. And <clears throat> I pulled it up when I saw all these great silver, uh, ma silver machinery, because I just thought it'd be fun contrast. So again, uh, you, you get to see what it would look like if it was in the space. This one's particularly beautiful. This is done by the ICA, and it's actually featuring uh, Evelyn Reyes, who's a, um, a, a cancer survivor. And um, the, it's a, a whole exhibition of images based on uh, the Gilded Project, which is about the art of healing. Gina Wolfo put this concept together, and it was about the, uh, the Japanese uh, practice of kintsugi, where you highlight uh, you know, cracks and, and flaws with gold. And uh, so as you can see uh, near her, her waist, um, there's a little accent on her scars uh, from um, procedures that she had undergone. So some really beautiful things we could share again with the public. Then we have student work featured at MIT. This is from the New View program that combines technology and fashion. They do a great job with that. It was so, so much fun to feature their work. Um, textile artist Amy Nguyen down by the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Um, MSJ and A Studio who does jewelry in Copley Square. And we were able to cut out you know, the images so that in theory, you could stand behind it and see what it looks like on you. Uh, but we did it with uh, 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 John uh, Singleton Copley, uh, just for a little fun. And then <clears throat> at Copley Place at the mall, uh, we were able to feature two new recent graduates from uh, different programs. Uh, we have here uh, Jackie Bell, at, and then we have Mason Leonard. And then we played a little round with scale as well. We feature the footwear designer, uh, Chris Donovan. And uh, again, we were, you're able to control the scale that you wanna display it on. So we thought it would be fun to have his shoes all over the city, but in giant form. And then here a feature, a little vignette of some of our leading designers like David Joseph, Daniel Fauché, 
Alfred Fiendaka, Denise Sajar, and Faraz Youssef, all featured at the BPL. Uh, they've done the, the fashion luncheons that were uh, that Marilyn Reisman started a long time ago. And then here's a feature of fashion photographer at the Prudential Center. It actually works seamlessly. It almost looks seamlessly into the architecture of the building. And then here we have a, a new knitwear designer, Monica Ramizi, uh, featured at uh, Alicia Daniels' shop at the uh, in the lobby of the Mandarin Oriental, Boston. And one of my favorites. This was a little collab collaboration between uh, Andrea De Tulio and myself and the School of Fashion Design. Uh, we got Fenway Park to actually be one of our locations. They even put up this great signage so people going to the park could uh, could uh, uh, use that QR code to see these specially made skirts uh, that feature both uh, our, our alumni, Andrea, as well as the CAD program where we design fabrics. So we did these special fabrics just for Fenway. And then uh, we had Candice Wu. She's a former student of mine who does bridal wear and you could also do video. And I just wanted to show you this in action. It's quite beautiful, superimposed over the public garden. So you get a little, uh, a little sort of action in the image as well. And uh, all of these were shot differently and then composed. And then finally, Tom Solo, one of our, our re, uh, local uh, incredible shoe wear designers as well, here at the Hancock Building. So, uh, and we also had, which was really, I mean, it's always great, great to get press, but this mean, meant a lot to me. Um, we had a leading resource for the AR community write about uh, the biggest and first of its kind fashion experience in AR. So there've been lots of different things, but um, um, I'll just show you uh, how big it was by the numbers. So we had 43 uh, fashion designers, artists slash teams, because there were a lot of people involved, over 94 locations throughout Boston. Uh, we featured, uh, over, I think it was over 420 objects. And by the end of the week, we had had uh, 16,000 views. And one of the nice things about it, we made it location specific to get people out of the houses, but so that they could do it safely on their terms. Um, but now, if you go to the Boston Fashion Week website and you have the app, you can open up any of the 43 galleries um, at home. So you can see all this design work right in your living room or at work or wherever, wherever you want to see it. So uh, it's a fun new territory for us to explore. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So um, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I, I'm really first and foremost a teacher. Uh, in addition to working with all these great professional designers, I'm really proud to be part of the educational process for designers in training. I love teaching. Uh, teaching is also at the heart of books I've written. Um, I've written three and collaborated on two. Uh, this is actually my first book published in 2009. And it's, uh, it's actually been translated into, uh, into German, Chinese, Spanish, and just this fall into French. They've called it La Mode, which is kind of cool. Um, and, uh, and it was really designed to serve as a primer to the fashion industry. So I kind of want to do that tonight for you in a kind of very simple way. So as a way of understanding what goes into, uh, into the fashion process that we see on the runways, magazines, and your Instagram feeds, uh, let's explore each of the topics in the book and why it's so important. So the, the book is uh, broken down into six sections, research, edit, design, construct, connect, and evolve. And so the first, uh, the first area is research. And this is one of my favorite areas. I love to dive uh, deep into research. It's always so inspiring. So there are a few subcategories under this, <clears throat> under this heading. And for each of them, I always start with a question as a prompt to get the conversation going. So the first thing I think that's really important to do when you're setting up anything, a business or uh, about to embark on a career is to ask yourself um, personal questions. Like who are you in this space? Who do you wanna be? What role do you want to have in this community or in this process? 
So taking stock and asking yourself, you know, who's showing up when you show up. Um, and being really clear about strengths and weaknesses. So that's part of that research phase, but again, starting with you. Then we move to collection theory. How do you distill an idea? And this is very important in fashion because a lot of people, if you, you know, if you're creative and can draw, you can probably come up with a great dress design, right? We can all kind of uh, imagine what we would do, but <clears throat> what we want to think about when it comes to fashion in, in the bigger industry is thinking about taking an idea and um, using it in all different ways throughout a collection so that you have a cohesive concept, but also so that you create choices for your customer so that they have, you know, it, it, they, you may, they may love you, what you did, but they may not wear skirts that short or a sleeveless top. So they, you know, you want to offer them uh, different choices, but again, uh, taking advantage of that wonderful idea. So more than just an assortment of, a, of one of a kinds. And then, of course, we have fashion history. And I think you all know how I feel about that. I'm very, I, I love fashion history and uh, exploring uh, fashion history. That's one of the courses that I teach. And I, I, when I meet students in, uh, around our fashion history course, I always say to them that, you are, are you ready to accept your inheritance? Because this is what it is. It's a legacy that we inherit the minute we decide to, uh, you know, to go towards fashion and say, I want to explore that, I wanna study it. And it's really important not to dismiss the history because we can learn so much and build on it. And then finally, in the, that section of research, we want to think about um, how do you form educated guesses? Because forecasting has a lot of mystique around it. People you know, think it's kind of magical. And really what it is, is being really well-informed, staying in touch with your industry, and, um, and, and again, learning what popular culture is doing, what's happening in politics, very much like you know, the exhibit, that um, the current exhibit. And, it's then taking those guesses, but from an informed place. So all of this kind of plays into that, that process of research. Okay, so to our next one. The next phase is the edit. And this for me is crucial. So many people don't edit enough. And you really want to have, you know, um, collections, stories, all of this be very tight. And uh, the first area of this is asking the right questions. So are you asking the right questions? Um, I can give you an example um, based on something that I always tell my students. I think dreams are great, but I think that instead of asking if you should follow your dreams, I ask how you can start to prepare for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, um, uh, the following part to me has always been a little passive and I think we need to take charge of the process. And I think that's when opportunities show up. Um, so we're, that kind of reframing is something that I think is very important um, in this process. And then we have mood boards. Um, we've heard of vision boards and collages, uh, but mood boards are kind of the pantry for, for the design process. This is where you stock the pantry with all the colors and the ideas and all the things you think might go into this collection. And then when you're looking for silhouettes and color palettes and beautiful details, you go to that board and it, that's where you shop. That's where you look for the ingredients. Um, and I find that helps narrow the whole process, much like the editing process. Then uh, fashion libraries. Um, why should you start building a fashion library? Uh, a, it's empowering. And B, more important than anything, it's selected by you. So you are curating and editing uh, the kinds of books that you want to do, I mean, want to have um, access to. And then it's, all, it's also important to remember that beyond books, you have magazines and video, uh, especially with all the incredible fashion documentaries out there. And even Pinterest can be a great tool for uh, building libraries. We used to actually do tear sheets for magazines and have them in you know, a file folder. And, but now you can do it all digitally. So it's a great, uh, a great tool for, uh, for building a fashion library online. Then specialization. How do you decide what to specialize in? 
And the key for me is to experiment and put yourself out there. Always say yes to learning something new. If the opportunity affords you uh, the chance to, uh, to, to learn about a new technique or uh, experiment with a new material, that is how you will find that specialization. I think um, having a preconceived notion of where you're gonna go before you've experienced everything um, re really narrows your choices. Then profiles. Now profiles are really important when it comes to your customer. Um, there's a big difference between art and fashion in terms of how we dialogue. So uh, art is kind of a monologue. We're kind of shouting out what we're about, but the design process really uh, relies on knowing your customer, getting to know them so that you can serve them well. And I use that, that word a lot, serve, because I think with that mentality, we really are excited about um, you know, fulfilling the needs and dreams of our customers. Then we have finally in that section, uh, budget, time, and money. Uh, most people don't wanna think about it, how much time it takes or how much money it may, I mean, it takes, but that's uh, a key factor in your success. So now we move into the next section, which is design. So with design, we have um, four major areas, color. Working with color, I think to me is one of the most important things because uh, it has such impact and you create wonderful color stories. Uh, then we have textiles. This is all about surface design. So this adds a whole other layer to whatever colors you choose. Uh, you wanna think about pattern, about texture, about embellishment, uh, about technology and science as well, because now there's so much performance fabrics, so many performance fabrics out there. Then silhouette. This is where I start the design process. I think you want to rough out the shape. It becomes your canvas. And then you can start to put in details. Uh, accessories are uh, kind of our, our accents on everything, the little details that uh, help us tell a story. I always say a little back, the same little black dress can be styled with different accessories and look um, uh, incredibly different. You know, you can have fishnets and combat boots or pearls and heels and with the same little black dress. Next up is construct. Uh, figuring out how to put it all together. And this is part of the maker in me that I get really excited about all these techniques and things you have to do. And for me, uh, it starts with the rendering, with the drawing. And probably the most common thing I hear when I tell people that I, uh, I teach people how to draw is, uh, oh, I can't draw. And, and my answer is always the same. Yes, you can. You just haven't figured it out yet. And one of the, the key things to learning how to draw to me is compartment, compartmentalization, uh, which is all about breaking it up into manageable steps. Then we have pattern making. This is the key to fashion, at least from the commercial side, because fit is everything. If it doesn't fit, it's not going to sell. And then we have stitching, putting it together, learning about your machines, all the different wonderful machines out there, as well as the old crafts, the hand crafts, because they are in danger of disappearing. So the more we can teach younger people about them, the better. And then finishing. This is a pet peeve of mine, especially when I see new designers is, you know, take the time to do that finishing work on a beautiful garment, the pressing, trimming threads, uh, and even the packaging, you know, delivering it is part of that design process as well. Our next stage is connect. Um, finding ways to uh, connect with your audience because designers don't have the luxury of just designing pretty clothes anymore. They need to think about all these other things um, after, it's, after it's made of how it gets to the customer. How do we engage people? Um, the first one is portfolios. Now, portfolios are usually just a, uh, thought of as a collection of, <clears throat> of someone's work, but I always like to think of portfolios in volumes, and you can kind of uh, put together uh, versions of your portfolio depending on the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, branding. Now, this is one of those terms that gets misunderstood. A lot of people think of branding as the color of your logo or your logo. 
And that's definitely a part of it, but really it's about what you stand for. So, um, and, and I always ask too that, you know, who, who owns your brand? You obviously own your company, but in the end, your customer is a part owner in that process because the minute they stop believing that you're gonna deliver on your promise of what you're all about, they're gone. All right, then we have marketing. And this um, is about where you fit in the market. So we had the goal, the personal goal at the very beginning, but here you need to strategize and understand your market and how to position yourself in it. And then for shows, I always start with the question, do we need fashion shows? And I love fashion shows. I've done 27 years of fashion shows, but you don't. And this is an important thing that we learned, uh, you know, during our first lockdown, the, the fashion community had to get very clever about how they shared content and got people excited about their collections. So everything from uh, little movies to uh, museum type installations um, became alternatives to showing fashion. Then um, we have our final section in the book, which is all about evolving because in fashion, you're only as good as your last collection. Nobody cares how good you used to be. That's actually a Paul Smith quote. And it's very important to remember that, that you need to keep feeding that creative process. So celebrity, we all know that celebrity is a big part of fashion, but ask yourself, um, is it relevant to what you're doing? Because sometimes chasing that idea of celebrity, uh, can really just be um, uh, uh, not effective. It could just kind of fall flat. Um, then there's art when it comes to fashion. And, and the industry definitely uh, has this, this question always uh, going back and forth about whether or not fashion is art. And I don't think that's the right question. I think the right question is, when is it art? When does it rise to that level? Because it certainly does. I mean, there are certain things um, you know, that designers do that just takes it to another level. It shouldn't be necessarily the focus for a designer, but when there's a there's real craftsmanship and artistry as part of the process, I think we need to respect that. Technology. We need to accept that technology uh, is a part of every facet from the commercial side to the design process. Um, for fashion. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we want to incorporate it into that creative process? Then sustainability. What will your fashion footprint be? What measures will you employ in response to the uh, needs of the planet? This no longer is like an extra thing, you know, that we an afterthought. Now we're incorporating this into the classroom experience, mainly because I mean, besides it being a good idea, but also because um, students are asking for it. That is where their heads are at. Um, awareness. What kind of culture do you want to build? Uh, you know, things like fair trade and good, good working conditions is all a part of that conversation as well for this new generation of designers. And then experience. This is the question I get all the time from uh, new designers, like, you know, jobs are asking for experience. How do I get it? And for me, it's been a matter of get, assigning myself projects throughout my career. I've, I've signed myself things that I wanted to accomplish, and that becomes an item on my resume. So, you know, you want to think about being kind of a self-starter when it comes to that. And then finally, um, how do you find the right school? Education is such an important part of it, whether you go full time or take a single class. And for me, the advice is also about what is the, is always about what is the culture at that school? And does it feel like a community that you feel comfortable being with? You know, whether it's a smaller environment or a big institution, all of them work because, you know, we have the content that we're sharing, but it's really about how you want to experience it. So uh, I hope that exploring these topics has provided you with some insights into the creative process for a fashion designer. Uh, that's what I have for you tonight. Uh, thank you for listening. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have.
Can can I start? Hi, Jay. This is James Hi. Hogan. Thank you so much for doing this incredible presentation tonight. First of all, I wish that you had written this book. I wish that you were older and had written this book when it was would have worked for me because honestly, <laughs> it it's such an incredible tool for young designers starting and and thank you so much for making the life of the future well, generation. That means a lot. <laughs> no, but for the future generation, you have done so much work that, that thank you. So anyways, for the future designers. But um, so Jay, how important is the history of fashion to your creative process? Um, well, it's it's the first place I go. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of my first go-tos. Um, <clears throat> besides teaching it, I mean, I really, uh, you know, watching movies, I'm, I see a little object and I have to know what it is, you know, exactly. so I, it, I, I do deep dives and um, I'm always, uh, always researching something. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the nice things about seeing uh, movies, you know, historical movies and how costumers work with it is uh, that they often strive to bring something unexpected into the mix. And uh, that's always a treat for me. Oh, exactly, exactly. When I was a young designer in New York, um, I used to love working with my clients and I would borrow their older clothes, their Balenciagas and their oh. Chanel's and things. <laughs> I would take them home and, you know, work on them and, you know, rub, do rub offs and figure out how they made that shoulder work. It was just, you know, amazing. And it's funny because I remember being at FIT and sometimes my professor would be like, well, what are you doing? And it's like, I saw it on a Balenciaga jacket. Isn't it amazing? And I'd be like, wow, that's so interesting. So it's kind of, but, but I was wondering what your creative process was in relation to history. Thank you so much. Sure. Oh, Jay, I have a question. The um, pretty powerful exhibit spans from 1920 to 2020. And the, the themes you um, discussed, work, politics, creativity, and style, kind of our embody the exhibit. Um, what area or which theme appeals to you the most? Um, well, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, I, I, when it comes to history, one of the things that I, I kind of look for from fashion perspective is innovation. So um, that kind of takes me right back to the twenties, uh, you know, in terms of the beginning of the process. Um, and obviously with all the things that were going on in terms of politics uh, for that, um, but it's also this uh, resurgence of, of youth, you know, after World War I. So, you know, the whole, uh, the, the flapper, the energy of that. But then when it comes to innovation, um, someone like, like Madeleine Vionnet, who used uh, the bias cut in the 20s, is, is exciting for me, again, because they were making really drastic changes to what the norm was. So I would say, you know, I would probably be most attracted to that that initial starting phase of the, of this particular exhibit um, because because of all that. I I'm going to go from the high to the low, and I think that's the the most fun about fashion is that you can. When I was at FIT, we would scour the vintage shops and and get inspiration from, from things from many, many years ago, millions of years ago that you're still seeing now. I mean, does that still influence your students and influence you? Um, Definitely. I mean, one of the nice things uh, about uh, the that educational process at most schools is that um, Besides the fashion history, sometimes these students have actual access to vintage garments, you know, collected by the schools. A lot of the schools have started their own collections. And um, and that's always a treat because uh, like, you know, James was saying, you know, just finding that little detail that was that that a designer did, you know, the 20s, the 50s, whenever it was, um, is is a jumping off point for them. So, you know, sometimes they may not even like the, the style of the garment, right? Because it's not, they can't relate to it. But mm -hmm. when, when you open it up and can see, you know, how it's made or this hidden little pocket, you know, like when I told them, you know, oh, what about putting pockets in an evening skirt, you know, like a big ball gown skirt, they were, 
they were shocked. They were like, what? Pockets in a ball gown? You know, and, and yet, <laughs> yeah, and, and, um, and you no, know, well, I, I remember working uh, for Alfred Fiendaka and having his customers, you know, ask for hidden pockets. And it's mm. much like historical garments, you know, so there's all these different wonderful references. I'm wearing an historical garment tonight in honor of that. Um, this is probably from the 50s and I cannot give it away, get rid of it. I love it. I I just have worn it throughout my whole life. I must have gotten it about 50 years ago, but um, when I was in school, but it is, uh -huh. it's a really, really old garment that I love and you just made it come to life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well and uh, oh, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, uh, just because of uh, it's kind of on my mind, Virgil Abloh, who just passed away. Oh, um, one of yeah. the things that um, that he was saying uh, about, like the he was talking about the end of streetwear. And, you know, people were asking him what the next thing was going to be. And he really, uh, he said vintage, sort of, you know, uh, things that are going to kind of have longer lives. So I mm -hmm. think there's so many issues, including sustainability, but just this idea of investing in really great design and, and good clothes. And, and good design goes on forever. You know, it's so funny. I remember I worked for Ossie Clark um, at one point in my career, and he had you know, he was so hot in the 60s and 70s, and he was copying all of those vintage things, the bias cut things from the 20s. Um, and he said he used to go to all of the thrift stores and take them apart, which is makes me feel really old because the things that he was doing that then, the, when I worked there, are now considered vintage <laughs> for young designers. But Jay, I have another question. During the last 18 months, um, it, uh, it allowed our team to work on putting this show together pretty powerful and uh, Maura and Marlene and gave us some more time. But what opportunities and challenges do you think we face as fashion designers in the future with, with everything that's happened in the past, past 18 months? Um, it, it's a complex question, but I think the biggest challenge will be not being tempted to return to business as usual because at the same time that it's a challenge, I think um, it's an opportunity to change how fashion works, you know, like to kind of uh, think about what's not working and how, how to address that, how to it reinvent. And, and it's in the spirit of fashion too, because fashion is supposed to change. So mm -hmm. I think our, our work practices, you know, our, our uh, you know, company environments, all these different kinds of things, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to start thinking, oh, we can do whatever we want moving forward. You know, we can say we're going to change it and move forward in that direction. So I think that's, that, that's the best way I can, I can look at it because I think in specifics, everything is still so uncertain that I think the best thing you can do is, is figure out how you would want to reinvent yourself for this next mm -hmm. state. Yeah, I agree, I agree. What, what designer or young, what older designer, and I hate putting it that way, and what younger designer do you feel has the potential to make history? Hmm. Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to like uh, established designers, you know, his, that are a part or already part of the fashion history mm -hmm. um there there are certain designers that i that i've been consistently following since i was first introduced to fashion so um as, as uh, james has said you know the idea that uh the era i was trained in is now considered a historical era you know the 80s um, and you know is is a little rough sometimes <laughs> to hear from my students um, but I think uh, it, it, one designer from that era who still I get very excited about today is Ise Miyake, um, you know, just because, again, it's part of that innovative force behind design. 
Um, uh, but for new designers, it's really tough because uh, there, there's so many designers doing some really interesting stuff. I think not necessarily, they're not that new, but contemporary mm -hmm. in the market now. One of the designers that gets me really excited because they do have this vintage quality, but feel also really modern and contemporary is Del Pozo. Um, there's a crispness to their work that I, it's just really beautiful. And yet they're just as good with ornament. So uh, I love that combination of feeling like it's modern. It's not just recreating the past, but then still, um, you know, displaying wonderful mastery of, of those, uh, those beautiful craft skills. Uh, Virgil Abloh, uh, for people that are listening, uh, has had a wonderful, wonderful exhibit at the ICA in Boston. So if you have a chance and it's still up, I encourage people to see it. Definitely. Okay. So Jay, for those of us who are looking to unleash our inner fashion designer, um, what tips do you have to add, help us add a little uh, glamour or sparkle this holiday season? <laughs> um, I would say be bold. Um, I think we spend, if anything, uh, with all, everything that's been going on, you know, life is short. You need to embrace that vision of yourself that you have in your head, uh, because I know I'm, I'm guilty of this. Um, I, I'm in fashion, but uh, most of the time I'm, I'm in a work shirt and jeans and sneakers uh, just because I'm behind the scenes, you know. Um, but uh, it's funny, during this whole past, you know, year and a half, uh, I've been uh, treating myself to accessories because I don't think I'm going to change my dress too much, you know, in terms of, uh, especially at my age, but um, I've been going for some really daring scarves, you know, Paul Smith uh, and uh, Walter von Baron. I always say his name wrong, but um, just going for really bold things that make me smile. And uh, it's kind of my way to bring in those uh, those quote unquote, you know, fashion looks into my into my wardrobe. Uh, so I think that's a fun way to do it if you're a little shy is to uh, really embrace accessories. And um, one of the things I learned in school uh, was about trends was the, uh, the idea of being uh, uh, on-trend, off-trend, or trend adjacent. And I remember in, the, in school uh, when neon was really hot in the 80s, and I hated it. It was like, so it, it assaulted me when I looked at it. And I and my teacher said, uh, well, you don't have to be on trend. You can be trend adjacent. You can do all these beautiful neutral outfits, suits and dresses and accessorize with all that neon while it's it's having a moment. And so I think uh, I think that's the way to do it, because I, I think, you know, you want to be comfortable, but then it's 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 using whatever trends and whatever fun things are out there as a way to have a pop and feel like you're a part of it and express yourself. So, but, but definitely be bold and embrace color. I couldn't agree more actually. <laughs> I feel like I've been doing the same in uh, COVID over the Lululemon. <laughs> <laughs> a bright vest or a big scarf. <laughs> exactly, a little pop to get, create some energy. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, we had a couple of questions from our viewers, and one of them was, did you have to get permission from um, owners of Boston's public spaces to um, mount your displays? And no, because it was technically in public, in, in public spaces. So uh, we, we, we had a few places that actually hosted us, like uh, some of the hotels and the, um, uh, the, the mall and... Um, uh, some of the institutions had had you were able to see it inside as well. Uh, but that's one of the wonderful things about all this, too, is kind of uh, a new frontier. So, um, you know, everybody's experimenting. And the beauty of the thing is that it's unobtrusive. Uh, it's just like, you know, uh, while I was on the trains, you know, I opened up the app and experimented with looking at different things in these spaces. And and really, it's it's about. Uh, I really feel like one of the, the fun things that came out of it was that whole uh, mentality of a creative director, because you open it up and at first it takes a little getting used to, but then you start to go, ooh, I want that over there. 
or I want to have that behind it, you know, like, and you start uh, basically directing your shoot. And um, I think that's a lot of fun. And then you, you of course are, you know, supporting and celebrating, uh, you know, local designers, which is always a big plus for me. I agree. Um, another question that came in is how can somebody on a budget find good pieces at reasonable prices? <laughs> Ah, that's always a challenge. But um, I think, I mean, going back to the local scene, I mean, I think there's so many local designers who don't um, get the visibility they deserve. And for me, buying local is huge, you know, because uh, your, your money goes further in so many ways. You know, obviously you're supporting the local economy, but um, you can often get some really unique pieces that are not going to be part of the mass market. So I think even if it's uh, even if it's something you need to save up for a little bit, that isn't just a quick, fast fashion kind of buy. Um, I think it's worth it, and especially this time of year, uh, so many of them are doing open studios or sew a market. You know, um, so they're for the small craft um, element. Um, but then again, finding out who the designers are. Uh, that's one of the reasons we started with Boston Fashion Week. Um, so right now, if you went to the website and looked under the augmented reality section, you're going to see all the designers who participated. And like I said, we had 43 teams uh, and they're more than that. There are many more. Uh, so right away and they have their Instagram handles. So, you know, follow local designers, check out what they're doing, let them get on your radar. Um, you know, and it's so easy to do with social media now. That's a great idea. I love the idea of Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice oh, sort of passive feed. You get all this great content coming at you. Um, I It's funny, I uh, check out my feed in the morning the way, you know, I used to read the newspaper, you know, just I to do, get yeah. the feed and then I go on with my day. Yeah, that's funny. I do the same. <laughs> I think that's all the questions we had from the audience. Is anybody, um, Marlene or James? Good. It was it was wonderful. It, it was, was wonderful. Like a mini FIT college <laughs> class. Uh, <laughs> I took notes. <laughs> I took no, notes. Jay, it was really, really wonderful. And like I said, I wish that this had been available um, 40 years ago. <laughs> because seriously, it was, I mean, you've really opened the door for young designers and done so much research and are, you know, so knowledgeable and it's all things we all have to learn but you put it together and it things that took us you and i years to learn so yeah. thank you for sharing it with the future generation it's really pretty amazing thank you so much thank that you. means a lot to me no oh, thank you and and i i just like to, sh to say that um jay uh one of the designers uh, who was featured in boston fashion week was Cheryl Rich Richards, who photographed oh. um, all of our mannequins uh, for the catalog. And, and I think Marlene, you had said that, you know, truly it, it will be a collector's item. I mean, she did just a beautiful job. It's so, excellent. I have it, I have it right here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and I have your book right here. Ah. I am not, <laughs> I'm not a fashion designer. I learned so much and I really, I took notes and had a great oh. Thank you. Oh, that's the greatest compliment. Thank you. <laughs> well, a sincere thanks to our pretty powerful, pretty smart, pretty awesome team, our hosts and presenter, Jay, James, Moira, and Marlene. Our next Pretty Powerful program will be at the museum on site on Saturday, January 15th at 1 p.m. Join us to celebrate Abby Kelly Foster's 211th birthday. Suzanne Schnittman, the author of Provocative Mothers and Their Precocious Daughters, 19th Century Women's Rights Leaders, will share her stories about Abby Kali Foster and her daughter, plus three other mother-daughter teens. Books will be available for purchase and signing. And check out Tidepool Bookshop's curated books complementing the Pretty Powerful exhibit and programs. They make great holiday gifts. And stop by the museum to see our pretty powerful 100 years of voting and style exhibit up through March 31st of 2022. 
Again, the 100 page comprehensive catalog supplements the exhibit and makes a great holiday gift. It is now my pleasure to introduce Worcester Historical Museum's Executive Director, Bill Wallace. Thank you, Anne, and it's my pleasure, although I don't have pretty the catalog in front of me, nor do I have your book, Jay, in front of me, but it is my pleasure to thank all of you for, I think, a great program this evening, for joining us for this pretty powerful program, but also joining with our, our organizing committee that's so important to the success of this project and, and our Costume and Textile Council and, and the board of staff, of course, of the museum, but Jay, thank you for for reminding us of the importance of history, whether it be for fashion or for whatever we do and inspiring us to uh, take charge and, and use it to tell a story, to encourage participation and uh, help us develop whether it's costumes or new programs. Um, the Pretty Powerful program was sponsored in part by the Fred Harris Daniels Foundation this evening, a, a great local foundation, very much invested in the history of Worcester. In fact, Mrs. Daniels' dress is one of the first dresses in the exhibit, and also by the Mass Cultural Council, to whom we owe incredible thanks. As many of you are aware, the Mass Cultural Council is critical to the Commonwealth, and I see that as two words, the Commonwealth of the Commonwealth, as it inspires and supports so much of this understanding that we engage in of who we are, who we were, but also who we want to be and who we will be in the future. So we are grateful for all of the support. There are 69 sponsors of this, this incredible project. And we're grateful to all the supporters for who are, have been so critical to ensuring the future of not only the program that you're enjoying tonight, the one you will in January, but also the success of this exhibit and the stories that it shares about Worcester and how it inspires future people, future designers, future historians, future collectors, and also the future of the museum's collection itself. So thank you again for being here. We'll leave the chat box open for a few minutes so that you can leave your reactions to tonight's program and maybe your some thoughts about future programs or some things that maybe aren't in the exhibit that should have been and maybe will be in the redo. It's the role of Worcester Historical Museum to share these stories of Worcester, past, present, and also future. As Jay has reminded us tonight, it's our history, whether it's fashion or industry or socioeconomic, whatever it may be, it is ours. So we ask you to join us in that adventure by following Worcester Historical Museum on Facebook and Instagram. Come to see the exhibit, follow the, the posts that we, we present almost every day, pretty powerful posts are, are up every Tuesday. I always say yes to learning something new. And maybe it's not just learning something new, maybe it's sharing something new and becoming part of this huge adventure that's Worcester and Worcester history. So visit us at worcesterhistory.org and thank you for keeping Worcester's history alive today and for future generations. And beyond, be, on behalf of everyone at Worcester Historical Museum, our incredible team for this, for this project, to Jay, to everyone, thank you. Uh, we wish you all the best as the year concludes and we look forward to an exciting 2022. And we thank you for your support, your interest, but also your participation in this adventure that's our history. Thank you. <laughs>